This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, brothers and sisters and all listeners. I am Felicity Brink, worshipping at Ebenezer Congregational Church in Kales River. On behalf of our clergy, Reverend Dr. Theron and Mr. Antong, together with their wives, I invite you to share in our worship service and communion on this 19th Sunday after Pentecost. The first verse of Psalm 149 tells us to sing a new song to the Lord, praise Him in the assembly of His faithful people. Let's continue to do this. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Lynn Taylor, and I'll be doing the Old Testament reading. Our reading is taken from Exodus 12, verse 1 to 12. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, From now on, this month will be the first and most important month of the Jewish calendar. Annually, on the tenth day of this month, each family shall get a lamb. This animal shall be a year old male, either a sheep or a goat, without any defects. On the evening of the fourteenth day of this month, all these lambs shall be killed, and their blood shall be placed on the two side frames of the door of every home and on the panel above the door. Use the blood of the lamb eaten in that home. Everyone shall eat roast lamb that night with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. The meat must not be eaten raw or boiled, but roasted, including the head, legs, heart and liver. Don't eat any of it the next day. If all is not eaten that night, burn what is left. Eat it with your traveling clothes on, prepared for a long journey, wearing your walking shoes and carrying your walking sticks in your hands. Eat it hurriedly. This observance shall be called the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt tonight and kill all the oldest sons and firstborn male animals in all the land of Egypt and execute judgment upon all the gods of Egypt for I am Jehovah this is the word of the Lord good morning Ebenezer family and a very very good morning to all our regular viewers who um, join us on a Sunday morning for our worship service it is the first Sunday in spring it's really the opportunity for new life, for new beginnings, for spiritual life to once again prosper and a time for us to really start bearing the fruits of the Spirit. So welcome once again and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to your friend Felicity Brink who did our word of welcome, her daughter Lynn Taylor who did the reading for this morning and thank you very very much to Auntie Eunice Achilles, who did the flowers for us, thank you so much. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that your word will truly be a light for our feet. Allow your word to answer our questions. Allow your word, Father, to point us into the right direction. And so we approach your word this morning with an open mind and with an impressionable spirit as we ask you speak to us and help us father to understand your word amen on wednesday evening we had our devotions and the focus of the devotions was to introduce you to, to the theme for this morning and the theme is living a life in gratitude living a life of thankfulness directed at God. Last Sunday was a beautiful day. So the family and I decided to take a drive and we went through the Detroitskloof Pass, through Worcester, we took the back road through Valleystor, on, on the route back to Franjuk. The waterfalls and the snow was spectacular. I'm sure many of you took a drive towards Sierras also. 
Along the way, we also found patches of beautiful felt flowers. The orange, yellow, white and purple flowers all seemed to shout out at the same time, It's spring! It's spring! Really a beautiful spectacle. And as I sat down in the field looking at the flowers, it seemed to me as if the soil was giving thanks to winter. As if the soil was saying, thank you winter for all the rainfall that you have given to allow the seeds to prosper and to break free into this beautiful array of flowers. It felt in that moment as if spring was a true festival of thanksgiving in response to what winter has done. Our reading for this morning describes the events that leads to one of the first and oldest festivals in the Jewish religion, the Passover. The Passover is celebrated every year during springtime in the Northern Hemisphere and autumn in the Southern Hemisphere. And just as spring is a festival of thanksgiving for what winter has done, so the Passover is a festival of thanksgiving for what God has done. How God passed over the homes of the Israelites during the last plague in Egypt. And how God took the Israelites from slavery to freedom. Thanksgiving is very important in the Jewish religion, which is why they have many festivals throughout the year to give thanks to God. But the name Jew is embedded in the word thank you. Because the name Jew comes from one of the sons of Jacob, Judah. And in the original Hebrew, the name is Yehuda. And Yehuda literally means to give thanks. So the name Jew is embedded into the sentiment and embedded into the practice of thanksgiving. But you know, brothers and sisters, to live with gratitude, that virtue is important in most of the religions in the world. Islam has a beautiful verse in the Quran that says, if you count the favors of Allah, you cannot enumerate them. And then another passage in the Quran that says, therefore, if you live with a thankful heart, you do so to the profit of your own soul. That is beautiful. The Bible contains many verses from the Old Testament right into the New Testament to highlight the importance of thanksgiving. But I like what Paul writes. Paul writes to the new Christians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he writes this, In all circumstances, give thanks to the Lord. It's pretty clear. In everything, in every situation, give thanks to God. So for us as Christians, thanksgiving is very, very important. And that is why we come to the communion table today. Not just to remember what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us, but it is also a moment of thanksgiving for the sacrifice of God through Christ our Lord. Thanksgiving is very, very important. So Wednesday evening, we arrived at the conclusion that living a life of thanksgiving does not just happen all by itself. It is not a matter of course. But living a life of thanksgiving and gratitude needs to be an intentional and a deliberate action. And it's an intentional response to the intentional love and grace of God. That intentional love and grace of God that brings us to the communion table today. So our response must be intentional. So the question then is, how does this life look? This life of intentional thanksgiving, how does it manifest itself in our daily experiences and in our relationships. Once again, the Apostle Paul sheds very clear light on this 
He writes to the Colossians in Colossians 3 verse 17. He says, everything that you do, whether you say it or whether you do it, do it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in thanksgiving to our Lord, our Father. And then Paul continues to write in verse 23. He says, everything that you do, do it as if you would do it for the Lord and not for human masters. It's very, very clear. Everything that you do, do it as if you would do it for the Lord. Powerful, but scary at the same time, because it leaves very little room. In fact, it leaves no room at all for us to say anything or for us to do anything that is not an expression of thanksgiving to God. I'm going to have to be the first one to raise my hand and say that I don't always speak in ways that reflect thanksgiving and gratitude to God. And I have to be the first to admit that I don't always do things that is an expression of thanksgiving. But Paul says, in every situation, give thanks to God. In your highs and in your lows, in your victories and even in your failures, in your illness, in your health, when you are surrounded by life, and even when you mourn the lack of life, give thanks in every situation. Shoot, that is extremely powerful with many implications for our lives. If you are a young person, a scholar or a student, it means that you approach your studies not as if you are doing it for yourself, not as if you are doing it to please your teachers or your parents, but you do it as if you are doing it for the Lord. It means that you need to be committed and hardworking at what you do as a youngster. If you have a parent, if you are blessed to have both your parents, your reaction towards your parents is an expression of thanksgiving as if you are doing it for the Lord. So whatever you do towards your mother and whatever you say towards your father, we do and say that as if we are saying it to the Lord. That means a lot because it makes you think of what you say and what you do in response to your parents. Is this an expression of thanksgiving? If God himself was there, would God be happy and satisfied with what I say to my parents and what I do towards them. If I have employment, if I am privileged enough to have a job at a time in our country when it is such a scarce commodity, then the words of Paul say that I work not for my company, I work not for the state, and I don't work for myself, but I work as if I work for the Lord. My levels of productivity is an expression of thanksgiving for what God has given me. Reverend Carol Clutie Pitt says, Spirituality and work ethic go hand in hand. And I agree with her completely. So I approach my work as an expression of thanksgiving for what God has done for me, which leaves no room for corruption, for self-enrichment, for ego. That has no room if I am doing it as if I'm doing it for God. Every aspect of our life, everything that we do must be done as if we are doing it for the Lord. In my marriage, how I approach my husband, how I approach my wife, it must be as if I am doing it for the Lord. Therefore, the love and the commitment and the respect and the devotion is as if I am doing it for the Lord. 
the implications of these words of Paul, far-reaching for our lives. This is going to sound very simple to you, but even my life in church, it has to be done as if I'm doing it for the Lord, because believe it or not, brothers and sisters, sometimes I can come to church for myself. I can be involved in the church for myself or for other reasons. But God says it has to be as if I am doing it for the Lord. Everything that I do. I want to conclude this morning with a question that many people have asked me in my life. Why did you decide to go and study theology at the age of 41? Your life is already so busy. My answer to them is this. When I think of what God has done for me, how God has blessed me beyond anything that I could ever deserve, when the call came and when I heard God's voice ask me to go into the ministry, there was really only one response. And that was to commit myself to study and to do whatever is needed. I give myself to God because He has given me so much. Therefore, my response in everything I do is an attempt to do it for the Lord. Whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever your frame of mind is, do what you do as if you are doing it for the Lord. Let us give thanks to Him. The Israelites every year celebrate the Passover. It was not just done when they reached the Promised Land and after that they stopped. They continue with it. And it is such a wonderful festival every year. And so, brothers and sisters, you and I need to continuously give thanks to God in every aspect of our life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Amen. Please receive the blessing. May the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remind you constantly to live a life of thanksgiving. Amen. Dear friends, good morning. After the sermon uh, conducted by Edward, we move to the communion table. It's a virtual communion table. We've done it before when we will have the consecration of the elements and the setting apart. It's an empty church. Hopefully soon we will, won't be empty anymore. We are in the process of discussing and talking about opening worship again, uh, the sanctuary for worship. But we've got to do so carefully um, with all of the constraints and sanitizing and appointing uh, people to do various things. I think the term is a compliance officer that needs to see to all of that. So your leaders are busy discussing. I want to use the celebration around this communion table as a family moment, children as well as family moment, and I'll explain that in a while. Part of the regulations now is um, no touching. As we know, the church will be clearly marked. There will be crosses on the pews where people, where you may be allowed to sit and maybe you'll call in uh, to register your wish to attend um, and then we will only make a we can only make allowance for 50. They also request for baptism. That's going to be a difficult one because we are not allowed to touch a baby. There's not supposed to be any contact. Other churches are also discussing this. I was in conversation with Bishop Margaret, the Bishop of False Bay, and they are looking at consecrating water 
and beyond that we don't know whether parents will administer the baptism themselves. But it's easy to think about these things. It's more difficult to see how it will be reenacted. Today our reading is from Exodus chapter 12. Since Moses was called and set apart, a lot has happened. The Israelites have been oppressed. It's been difficult in Egypt. And this is the crucial moment that Moses was called for. Now you've heard of the Passover. The Passover must not be confused with our communion that is based on the Lord's Supper, even though there is a meal taking place as well. With the birth of Moses, uh, the firstborn, uh, male firstborn, were all... That's what I didn't explain our parents who were, were dying. Dying. Um, by the hands of the midwives and Moses was saved. But now there's a new death and this is all firstborn. Um, will, will, there was a plague and this plague will cause the firstborn all over to die, not only human beings but animals as well. And so they had to prepare for that. Now we know freedom from oppression um, never takes place without sacrifice. We know it in the South African context, the people in Zimbabwe are aware of that now. Freedom from bondage seldom proceeds without sacrifice. The Israelites needed to leave Egypt. They had to leave Egypt. It was getting too, uh, murderously difficult. And so there were a number of plagues. This is one of the last plagues where the firstborn would die. And so a special recipe was, was put aside and started um, that an animal would be, so, would be slaughtered um, and, and the, uh, what happens to the animal is explained that they will roast the animal over fire. Um, this all sounds so rudimentary when one talks about cruelty and when we've got vegetarians and, and vegans. But this is the custom. We're talking about an, an old custom. And the blood of the animal was then placed on the doorpost as a sign that the angel of death could pass. To this day, the Passover is still reenacted in Jewish homes. I think sometimes the mistake is made, and I've said that before, that the modern day Jews associate, equate themselves with the Israelites, with the Jews from biblical times. It is not true and it is not the same. There is no nation in this world that is elect or special. Um, I, I was going to mention what Judge Mokhoeng Mokhoeng said, but that can take it completely out of context. But let it suffice to say that the families were all together um, um, and, and then we are told that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire. They had to do so in a hurry, in a rush. They must be dressed because as soon as the sun, as soon as dawn broke, they, they had to leave and that was the 40 years that they were in the wilderness. This is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked in your belt your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. Literally eat it on the go. Families together. Bishop, the Archbishop, uh, the, the Pope, um, tells a story that when, when he was still a bishop in Argentina, that he listened to confessions a lot, that he really appreciated and loved. And people would often come and complain about problems and trouble in their family. And he said he turned it around. He would say to a mother or father, when last have you spent time with your children or played with your children? He reframed it. Reframed it completely. 
I think the COVID-19 virus could be, could be compared to that plague. And even freedom from the bondage of this plague uh, won't go without sacrifice. We've got to sacrifice being in home, not going to work, the complete sanitizing that happens and everything that takes place is for our own safety. And we don't know how this will change our conduct in the next few months, if not years. To not hug, to not embrace, to not look somebody in the eye and shake hand, hands completely. But hopefully during this time of lockdown, you spend time with your children and grandchildren, eating a meal together and celebrating together. That is what happened for the Israelites when they were delivered from bondage. We gather around the stable of the Lord, the Last Supper, not the Passover meal, where Jesus sacrificed his life for our freedom and even this sacrifice, uh, this freedom does not go without sacrifice, in which he sacrificed his life on the cross and when he sat with his disciples on that last supper, the last meal before his crucifixion. None of them really knew or could fully understand and grasp that was happening. And maybe later on it became clear. And, and the words of institution says, on the night of his arrest, he took bread. And when he had broken the bread, and he gave it to his disciples with the words, This is my body broken for you. Remember children, this is not flesh, it's not the body of Christ that we are eating, but it represents the body of Christ. Bread is our staple diet. We take bread to school, we eat it when we have a meal, and more so in rural areas where it is, it is used extensively. An important carb, an important carbohydrate. And that's what he gave to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so in memory of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup after supper. And I'm sure they must have been wondering what is taking place. What is happening? Why is Jesus so serious? He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Lord God, we pray that these elements will be consecrated and set apart for our holy use. Bread made by human hands and also wine that's been processed for our use. Bless our families, we pray. In this very, very difficult time, not as bad as the time in Egypt under Pharaoh experienced by the Israelites, but still scary and frightening all the same. Just as they did not know what the future hold, what the future held, neither do we know. Stage two, lockdown level two may have been better than lockdown than level three and level four but we live in fear all the same. So we want to gather as we do in our various homes, sitting together as families around a table. Lord, we pray that you will bless all of the tables where people are sitting or reclining. And as best we can, we want to reenact also that last supper. As we pray for your blessing on our families, it's also on our children who have to go to school and be exposed to the plague that we call COVID-19. Keep them safe and keep your church safe. Amen. 
And so we follow the example of Jesus in all that we say and do. Just as he took bread, so we take this bread and we eat it, reminding us of the body of Christ. And so to the bread, after the bread, when Jesus took the cup and said, this is my blood shed for you. So the bread which we break and the cup which we drink <clears throat> reminds us of the death, the sacrifice, but also the resurrection of Christ. We thank God for this meal where we come to be nourished until we meet again to gather together around this table. We will continue to celebrate this, celebrate this table on the go. May God grant that it would not be too long. And now, dear friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit remain with you and abide with you always. Thank you.